Uh, my name is Craig Davis, and uh, I'm the coordinator of environmental studies here at Iowa State. And I'd like to welcome all of you, and very nice turnout tonight, to uh, this seminar uh, entitled The Changing Face of World Hunger. Uh, the seminar tonight is being presented as a part of a development education project sponsored by the Quad Cities World Affairs Council and the Peoria Area World Affairs Council in cooperation with the World Food Institute here at Iowa State. The uh, funding for this project came from U.S. AID. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Terry Iverson, who uh, is responsible for getting this project off the ground, to tell you a little bit about what the overall goals of the project are, and then we will uh, uh, delve break directly into our two speakers. So, Terry, if you want to say the word. I will be very brief. Uh, first of all, one piece of housekeeping. I'm going to pass around the sign-up sheet and ask each of you if you would uh, put your name, address, your affiliation, or uh, company, or place of business, so that we'll have it as a matter of record and we can uh, notify you of future meetings or seminars at this time. Uh, as Frank said, this is a development education project. It's a rather new enterprise undertaken by the U.S. Agency for International Development. It's uh, uh, a program that has uh, several goals. First of all, is to increase the public's awareness of some of the problems related to world hunger and poverty. And secondly, in the case of this particular project, to give those of us in the Midwest an opportunity to look at some of the data that is complicating hunger and poverty worldwide, and then later on to develop a, a strategy for combating world hunger and poverty or, or various aspects of it. So uh, this evening is the, the first effort uh, uh, to get some of the information that we feel that we need in order to proceed with the uh, project. I would like to mention that there are two other communities in Iowa that are involved, uh, Waterloo and Cedar Rapids, and three in Illinois, uh, the Quad Cities area, Peoria, and Decatur. And they have similar sessions going on there uh, in the evening, uh, but focusing on uh, different issues and using different speakers, although there may be some overlap as we proceed with the project. But I too am very glad that you are here tonight. And I hope that during the discussion period following each of the presentations by our speakers, that you'll feel free to engage in a free and open discussion. Thank you. The overall objectives of this project are, uh, are four. Uh, number one, we want to provide an overview of world hunger as it exists today. Uh, number two, we want to disseminate information about multilateral and bilateral efforts initiated since World War II to deal with world hunger problems. And three, we want to provide a format so that participants in the work sessions will be actively involved during the project in developing strategies for combating world hunger and poverty. And finally, near the end of the project uh, this summer, uh, we are going to convene a world food conference, a world hunger conference, uh, probably in the Quad Cities, right? This will probably be held in May or June, in which the six working groups will, will uh, participate. In October and November of last year, the various working groups met and uh, set objectives for themselves. And I might just give you a list of a few of these objectives uh, selected from the list of the six groups. Uh, uh, one of the objectives stated was, uh, one of the questions that was stated was, what is the relationship between international trade and world hunger and poverty. Another, uh, what role can education play in coping with world hunger and poverty? What are the principal causes of malnutrition? What are the roles of science and technology in increasing food production and consumption? How are infant malnutrition and prenatal care for mothers related? How do women's roles affect fertility, food production, nutrition, and other related issues? What are the relationships between land use and food production? What is the status of food relief programs? And what are the cultural factors that must be taken into account when we promote development, especially in developing countries? The Ames group came up with the following five issues that it wanted to explore as it worked towards developing its strategies for uh, combating the world food problem. 
Number one, the importance of the world food situation to Iowa and Illinois. Number two, the impact of war on the world food situation. Number three, the relationship between population trends and the world food situation. Number four, the need for education and technical assistance programs for rural development. And number five, the third world debt and world hunger and poverty. Since this is a hands-on operation, uh, we hope that you will feel free to become actively involved tonight. Uh, don't think that you're here just to be listeners. We're going to have two presentations uh, followed by a discussion. And uh, there'll be a first presentation, then about 15 minutes of discussion, and the second presentation, and then we'll go until we're all worn out. Uh, those of you who would like to participate in the working, the Ames Working Group uh, after tonight uh, will have an opportunity to if you just put your name on the list that, that Terry is circulating because we will inform you of the uh, next meetings. Uh, it is my intention to get the Working Group together again in about two weeks to decide what we want to do next, who we want to bring in for speakers, what, what information we want to explore next in the hopes that we can uh, set up our next uh, seminar of this type for some time, uh, about six or uh, eight weeks from now. Our first speaker is Professor Wayne Moyer. Professor Moyer received his bachelor's degree from my home state, uh, the wonderful state of Virginia, where he went to the University of Virginia. And then he went on to uh, what some people think is a slightly better school, maybe uh, Yale University uh, up in Connecticut. Uh, he received his Master's of Arts degree there in International Relations, uh, a Master's of Philosophy in Political Science, and a PhD in Political Science. Uh, he joined the faculty at Grinnell uh, in 1971, where he uh, is now located. He's an assist associate professor and has served as chairman of the department for two stints, uh, the first stint, 74 to 78, and the most recent uh, uh, stint is still going on. He took over the chair in 82 and is, is still holding that chair down. Uh, Professor Moyer has done extensive research on the politics of food, has written extensively, and has been involved actively in this issue uh, for some time. And he's going to talk to us tonight on food, politics, and hunger. Mr. Moyer. Now, I'm, I'm certain that uh, most of you remember the November 1974 United Nations World Food Conference, which was held in Rome, which, of course, was called in response uh, to the world food crisis, which had shaken governments and people in the 70s in both the developed and developing countries. Uh, of course, galvanized by the famine in the Sahel, where thousands were dying daily of starvation, a period where world food stocks were at record lows, food prices seemed to be climbing nearly everywhere, and there were fears then that we were facing a continuing food shortage and that the world would never be able to feed its population again. There was, surrounding the conference, an atmosphere of great drama and gravity under the spotlight of international publicity as 5,000 delegates and observers from over 130 countries sat down to discuss reform of the international agricultural order. And of course, among the delegates were foreign ministers from various countries, including, of course, the US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, and ministers of agriculture, of course, including our own Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Botts. There were politicians, there were farmers, there were businessmen, there were clergymen, and there were nutritionists, quite a group. Now, as might have been expected with such a large and diverse group, there was the appearance, if not the reality, of chaos. But after 12 days where international bombast uh, 
alternated with serious discussion and bargaining, a consensus was reached on a series of resolutions designed to transform the international agricultural system, calling for such things as massively increased investment for agricultural production in developing countries, a world system of food reserves, the creation of a global early warning network so we could predict future famines, increased food aid, the establishment of a new international fund for agricultural development, and the establishment of a World Food Council to coordinate all international food production efforts. And finally, of course, a resolution to end world hunger in 10 years. In the crisis atmosphere which prevailed, uh, nations made great haste in implementing the conference resolutions, with the exception, of course, of the creation of a system of international food reserves, which was never implemented. And the start of the war against hunger was a very promising one indeed. Then the crisis passed. The famine in the Sahel ended, and I guess, although I, we're not quite sure, but I, somewhere between 150 and 250,000 starved, but we had expected more. The United States, of course, had a number of bumper harvests. Stocks were up, food prices stabilized, and everyone forgot about the World Food Conference and the problem of hunger. That is, they forgot about hunger until the starvation of about a million Cambodians appeared imminent five years ago. But again, the international community rallied, and we could take comfort that once again, we had warded off international starvation. Now, there really is no room for complexity, because I think it's fair to say the problem of world hunger remains. And if anything, it's at least as serious, maybe more serious, than it was in 1974 at the time of the World Food Conference. The problem of world hunger, of course, is not primarily a starvation problem, because comparatively few people starve annually. But rather, it is a problem of chronic malnutrition, where somewhere between 400 million and over 1 billion people, I think one of the most unfortunate things, and it's going to really be a difficult thing really to determine accurately, we don't really know how many people hungry. Part of that is that many of the hungry people are refugees, They're very hard to get a hold of. Part of the problem is that there are all sorts of different definitions as to what constitutes hunger. And so there's no agreement on how many people are hungry. The only thing that there is agreement on is that there are very, very many up in the order of at least 500 million people. Okay. The, the problem then is these people who are hungry, they don't really get enough to eat. Uh, there's a problem with protein, that their protein calorie intake is substantially below the body's minimum energy needs. Now, the malnourished, of course, or undernourished, are by no means evenly distributed around the world. Uh, half of them are in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. One-sixth of them are in other areas in East and Southeast Asia. One-sixth of them live in Sub-Sahara Africa. The rest are spread around in Latin America, North America, and the Middle East. One-half of them are children under five, usually from large families. There are more women than men. Three-fourths of them live in rural areas, and most could be classified as rural poor. The undernourished attract little attention internationally, and I think this is different from the case with starvation, because there often are no easily discernible outward symptoms. Uh, a child appears small for his age, he seems listless, or he's pale in color. Uh, this is not the sort of thing that television camera crews on locations are likely to home in on. And I would venture to say that as a result, that most people in the developed countries 
never having been malnourished themselves, are really still completely unaware of the problem. Now, even though the symptoms of undernutrition are not obvious, the effects, of course, are severe. Uh, extensive research by the World Health Organization and others clearly reveals that malnutrition seriously hampers motivation, concentration, physical stamina, the ability to work, and, of course, the ability to learn. The net impact has been and still is an enormous loss to the human potential and in terms of productivity and the development efforts of the affected countries, which are, of course, usually the poorest countries. At an even more basic level, it is estimated by the World Bank that malnutrition is directly responsible for more than 12 million deaths annually among children each year, although the cause, the apparent cause, is usually pneumonia, measles, or some other disease. Now, I'm going to argue this evening that the world has not dealt very effectively with the malnutrition problem because of a number of things. First, that the main thrust strategy emerging from the World Food Conference, which was a massive commitment to increase agricultural production, though it has had considerable success in increasing yields, considerable success everywhere except in Africa, and we'll talk more about Africa later, is alone inherently unable to solve the world hunger problem because it does not adequately take into account that people are usually malnourished not because of a lack of, of, a lack of available food, but because of a lack of resources which they can use to buy food. And then secondly, I will argue that the political and bureaucratic factors in developing countries, and I should add parenthetically here in the developed countries as well, have biased the implementation of the agricultural production strategy so as to limit its potential both for increasing food production and for increasing the incomes of the rural poor, uh, who are generally the ones malnourished. And then three, that even though there is strong evidence that programs to increase the ability of the poor to buy food and to provide them with nutrition education, can, when combined with agricultural, with the agricultural production strategy, health care, birth control, and work, that these programs can end world hunger in the foreseeable future. And, and uh, I, w I should stress here that if we could ensure that if that food gets to the poor, that a mere 32 million tons of grain, or something like 2% of the world's production, um, that's how close we are to having enough food. The problem is not a shortage of food, but getting the food to the people who need it. It's much more of a distribution problem than a production problem. But if we could merely get an additional 2% in terms of food production, which would cost something like $8 billion, um, about the cost of uh, three Trident submarines, um, then, and, uh, then we could end hunger. If we could if we could take the appropriate measures in terms of health care, in terms of nutrition, uh, diet supplements, and so on and so forth. But I am going to argue that these programs probably will not be adopted because the political matrix is all wrong, both in the developing and the developed countries. And I will argue that this is true because the hungry have little political power or even voice in the national or international affairs of the countries where they live. Now, I'd like to look first at the food production strategy uh, that developed after the uh, World Food Conference. Uh, after the World Food Conference, of course, investment in agriculture increased very rapidly. I think about $4 billion, what it was at the time, to well over $8 billion today, although this is still somewhat less than the amount that the Food and Agriculture Organization estimates is necessary to stimulate the targeted 4% annual increase uh, in agricultural production. There has, in fact, been a significant increase in world food production, which has run about 2.7% uh, annually throughout the developing countries. 
There has been, however, great differential in the production record, uh, where on one hand you have Asia, where the green revolution in hybrid seeds and technology has generally been adapted, and where production increases have run in many instances over 3%. Thailand at one stage was going over 6% a year. You have Asia on one extreme, and then on the other extreme you have Africa, where the green Re revolution has not taken hold, and where food production is only slightly increasing, and per capita food production is actually declining. So the situation in Africa is, in fact, getting worse. Now, however, at the same time as food production in the developing countries has been increasing at 2.7 percent, demand there has been increasing at about 3 percent a year, mostly because of population growth, but not only because of that, but also because of increased incomes and better diet on the part of the upper classes. So you're having a situation where a good part of the food production increase is not going to the poorest people, but to people who are higher up on the social ladder who have the ability to pay, and so that they are, in fact, improving their diets before some of the very poor are able to improve uh, their diets. Now, um, the result with the increased demand on food that existed in the, in the late 1970s was, of course, uh, vastly increased food imports from the United States. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, one of the consequences of that was uh, ever-increasing uh, dependence on food imports. Um, and uh, it, it, the situation developed by the end of the 1970s where it appeared that the third world uh, uh, had become uh, extremely dependent on the United States, which would not be able, although this appears to have changed more recently, uh, to keep up uh, with the demands that were placed upon it. I don't think in the long run, even though we're in a surplus period now, the United States can still keep up with the food needs of third world countries. Um, and it is still important uh, uh, that they develop uh, even more and, and, and even more effective uh, agricultural production strategy than they had uh, in the uh, late 1970s. Now, um, the trend in terms of food imports, I think, could generally be regarded as unhealthy. Uh, the huge sums that the LDCs have spent and are spending uh, on food imports is money that should be spent for other development purposes. The strains on developed country food production uh, have already shown, and as I said a few minutes ago, I think that uh, uh, it's something that for the future we have to think very seriously about and that I don't think that we're going to be able uh, to keep up in the long term with all of the potential demands which could exist uh, from the th third world countries. Uh, we are approaching a point where the situation will become so precarious that a major crop failure in, for instance, such an area as the Corn Belt, uh, perhaps something comparable to the, the, the famous uh, uh, crop failure of 1936, uh, will be sufficient in the absence of sufficient international reserves uh, to really send thousands of people around the world uh, into a situation uh, of starvation. Now, what went wrong uh, with the uh, agricultural production strategy? Um, one school of thought was that if enough produced uh, if enough food was produced, that for some kind of trickle-down effect, it would become available to all of the hungry people. And we have seen, of course, that that assumption uh, was wrong. Where a surplus was created, it generally was not distributed to the poor. And in general, it improved the diets of those who could pay or those who had power. For instance, there are very few armies in any country 
that are not very well fed. Now, there was another argument that was made at the time of the World Food Conference that since investment in agriculture would probably mostly be spent in the rural areas where crops were produced and where most of the poor live, and since most of the increased profits from production would also be spent in the same area, that enough income would be generated to allow the poor to buy food. And this argument ignored the reality that most of the rural poor do not own land and, in fact, live outside the market and, hence, are not in a position to benefit directly from food production increases. Now, what about the failure to increase yields as much as expected? As I say, the food production strategy worked in increasing food yields, but probably didn't work as effectively as, as had been hoped. Um, what, what made it fail, uh, and what, in fact, uh, caused the program not to increase the income very effectively in terms of, uh, of poor farmers? And I think it's fair to say that there's been a very serious problem with poli political leadership in many third world countries, and I think Africa has suffered some of the most serious failures. Most of the leaders in third world countries come from backgrounds very, very remote to agriculture. Uh, if the leaders have come from agriculture, they're quite anxious to get away from it, and agriculture has not been a particularly high priority. Doctors, lawyers, soldiers, economists. Uh, very little experience in general with agriculture. Uh, not especially concerned until very, very recently. And I think even substantially after the 1974 World Food Conference with agricultural production. Um, most of these countries, and again, I think the African case is particularly serious, had little expertise in terms of agriculture. No land-grant colleges, uh, no experiment stations, uh, not really able to adapt new technology to the particular problems of these countries. And the governments didn't give agriculture enough priority. The emphasis was on industry so that they could, they could start working on these things in the years immediately after the World Food Conference. Um, most of what expertise existed was, of course, inherited from colonial days, and much of it was linked to producing cash crops uh, for export. We'll talk more about this later. In many third world countries, agriculture was not seen as a particularly prestigious uh, field. Um, and as I mentioned a minute ago, the, the real emphasis was on industrialization. So most of these countries were very slow to get on the ball and took a long time to get things going, and there have been many mistakes. So the food production increases have not been as great as might have been expected. Now, one of the first mistakes that was made was that there was a bias in favor of grandiose projects. Uh, grandiose projects make very good publicity for very insecure political leaders, make a lot of news. But grandiose projects uh, have a lot of requirements in terms of administrative personnel. And most third world countries have a shortage of administrative personnel. Uh, and many of the projects were too complex for the bureaucracy to administer. Um, there was also a problem that many of the projects were too, too expensive and too capital intensive, and they wasted uh, resources. Many of them had insufficient research support. In many instances, farmers were put out to work or were put out of work, I should say. Uh, in many instances, since you're talking about large proje projects where the workers themselves had no stake in the projects, uh, their motivation was low, uh, and they perhaps did not work as hard as they could. And indeed, many of the projects, by, both by putting workers out of work, farm workers out of work, and by not giving them any kind of incentives, 
uh, contributed to the migration to the cities, which, of course, as I think you all know, is one of the most serious problems in the third world, where I think it's estimated that by the year 2000, there will be more than 40 cities in the third world with population over 5 million people, uh, as opposed to simply 12 cities in the uh, developed countries. Now, there was, a, there was also a tendency for large farmers to dominate the agricultural production uh, projects at the expense of the small farmers. Large farmers could afford to take larger risks. Small farmers, knowing if they made mistakes, they lost everything, were rationally more risk averse. It's not that small farmers were not innovative, it's simply they couldn't afford to take the risks. So, well, you found a situation where it was the large farmers who took the risks, risks who got the benefits, and they've pr profited disproportionately uh, from the food production, uh, revolution in food production technology. Now, uh, on this point also, agricultural extension agents in third world countries have in general tended to be much more responsive to the needs of the large farmer rather than to the needs of the small farmer. Part of that's a class phenomenon, that when an ag agricultural extension agent from the city himself goes into a rural village, it's, he'd much, he's much more comfortable dealing with the rural elites than he is with the poor rural farmer. Um, larger farmers, and I, this is true anywhere in the world and even in developed countries, naturally command the necessary inputs in terms of credit, in terms of seeds, in terms of, of fertilizer, uh, and in, in good part because of their status in the community. Then again, some of the technology, certain types of irrigation systems, for instance, was more applicable for larger farmers. Larger farmers, of course, often converted to capital-intensive methods, partly because they had a sickly workforce, which was malnourished, and then that also contributed to the urban migration. And then another general problem in the third world is that small farmers historically have been divided. The politics in these countries is generally the politics of patronage. Uh, they've not been conscious of any class identity. They haven't been able to organize to get their fair share. Now, the tragedy is that as a result, production suffered. And while it's well established that yields per acre are greater on smaller farms, and that's, of course, if you own your own land, and uh, you probably will work harder. And, e and even though small farms uh, don't have the same kind of management problems as large farms, uh, unfortunately, in, in most third world countries, uh, the product production increases on small farms have been somewhat disappointing. Now, the, there was an inability and unwillingness, I think, in general, and I think that's still true, um, in uh, it was an unwillingness on the part of uh, developing country leaders to seriously implement land reform. Uh, this, is, uh, this problem varies in seriousness in different countries. Uh, in Latin America, in general, 10% of the farmers own 90% of the farmland. That's probably where the problem is most serious. In Asia, it's a little less serious. 20% of the farmers own 65% of the land. Worldwide, something like 100 million farm workers own no land at all, which is a lot. Um, now, I think it's, it's important to consider both uh, for the income generating effects and because of the effects, the effects uh, on productivity to note that tenant farmers who are asked to assume all of the risk of production um, only get part of the profits, and who only get part of the profits, tend in general uh, to be less innovative. Now, land reform is, of course, the most po difficult political decision, one of the most difficult political decisions that a country can make. It generally pits the urban-based government, which is often weak in rural areas, against rural elites. And very few governments have been strong enough to carry land reform out. 
Where it has happened, significant productivity increases have resulted. The countries that are normally uh, mentioned in this regard, of course, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Japan, and China. The uh, developed countries, and particularly the United States, have not pushed very hard for land reform. And they have, in general, not wished to sta destabilize the, the various regimes, many of which are, are very weak, on grounds, of course, that they don't want to allow communists to get a foothold <coughs> in these areas. OK, so there's a problem with land reform. There has been another problem in terms of the failure of governments to invest adequately for research and training of agricultural workers. Uh, local research is very important uh, for most, uh, most agricultural products. Um, work done in US universities, while it's helpful, is not always appropriate for areas where the climate uh, and geography is vastly different. Um, it's also important that, uh, that, that the, the people who are going to be carrying out agricultural development in third world countries uh, are appropriately trained. They sometimes can be overtrained, and sometimes the training they get in this country is not adequate for the particular problems which they face uh, back home. Um, one of the problems in third world countries, and it gets back to the question I was, the point I was making a few minutes ago about the political leadership, is most of these countries are extremely poor. They have many calls for very limited funds, on very limited funds, because agriculture hasn't been the highest priority. Uh, it has not gotten very much of the available pie, which in itself is very small. And that's complicated by a difficulty that in most the poorest countries, at least, agriculture is not well enough developed to have a domestic constituency. So it hasn't got very much political power. Traditional landlords have not been particularly enthusiastic about uh, local research. Uh, conceivably, they don't particularly want, and I think this is pretty self-evident, to change the established order. Um, now, this problem, I think, is much more serious in sub-Sahara Africa where the problem is the most serious, uh, than it is uh, in Asia. Now, there's been another problem that much of the uh, success in Asia, where hybrid seeds and all have been, and, and, and where much of the agriculture is irrigated agriculture, much of the technology that was developed with regard to the Green Revolution, at least, has not been easily transferable to the different climate of Africa. Now, another problem. Governments have often failed to recognize that you must not only provide the seeds and technology uh, in terms of agriculture, uh, for agricultural production, but also the inputs. And you've got to get water there, you've got to get fertilizer there, and you've got to have the appropriate infrastructure, transportation, and storage. They did some of these things, but they didn't do all of these things. And if you really wanted to increase agriculture production, you should do all of these things together. And so there, there have been problems there. Uh, in terms of storage, at least, uh, there are, have been and still are very serious crop losses around the world. The best estimates I can find is that it runs, that they run something like 10 to 20 percent of the crop. Uh, and if you could get that 10 to 20 percent of the crop back, or if you could save a good part of it, that would uh, go a long way uh, to providing uh, the food which the world really needs in terms of providing uh, for adequate nourishment. Uh, there's a very serious problem in many countries in terms of uh, bureaucracies or agencies within the bureaucracy uh, operating uh, in, uh, in, in, in very serious rivalries. Different inputs are commanded by different bureaucracy, bureaucracies. The ministry that controls transport doesn't also control water. And many of these bureaucracies are very jealous of their authority. Many of these agencies are jealous of, the, of their authority and don't co coordinate their activities very well together. Of course, that isn't just a third world problem. That's a problem everywhere. But it's been, it's been a particularly serious obstacle in trying to increase agricultural production. 
Um, at least as far as the infrastructure is concerned, uh, governments have sometimes been unwilling to make the necessary investments because infrastructure is expensive and it takes you some time to see the benefits after the fact. Now, governments um, have often been unable to establish an effective marketing system for their crops and, of course, have failed, and I think this is particularly serious, to provide farmers with adequate production incentives. A farmer, of course, has no incentive to produce if he can't market what he produces. And in, in a, quite a number of countries, governments have destroyed traditional marketing systems, which worked reasonably well, and imposed government controls. And what often happens is that the government doesn't like the price signals which are sent. It takes over. The prices are set by bureaucratic whim, or worse, because of political pressures, which sends out all of the wrong production signals. And then there's the additional problem that when the government takes over the marketing itself, it becomes too great a demand for the capabilities of the bureaucracy. So in many of these instances, and Africa here again is particularly serious, the marketing system has broken down. And with a marketing system broken down, it's not, it, it, there are no incentives for the farmers to produce. Um, as far as prices are concerned, farmers are not organized. Urban consumers are. That's, in this country, I, it's a problem I think you can relate to. It's always been hard for farmers to set their prices. Uh, the urban consumers, of course, threaten violence, which is a very serious political threat to many, many governments. And they establish unstoppable pressures to keep prices low, which, of course, creates very serious disincentives for food production. So you have a situation where in many countries, and again, I will point out to Africa, what you do is you tax the farmer and subsidize the consumer because of the differential political power where the consumers are much more powerful politically than the farmers are, which acts as a disincentive to agricultural production, which, of course, uh, hinders the effort uh, to provide adequate food. Um, needless to say, uh, the West has contributed to this, less so, I think, in the present than in the past, with our own food aid that much of food aid given in the past was surplus disposal aid, uh, our surplus, which we were disposing. And a good part of it was given for political reasons. And often it was used to keep food prices down, um, support the government, keep the government in power, but of course provides all the wrong sorts of incentives for food production uh, in third world countries. And of course, what happens when prices are low uh, is that very promising agricultural production projects, new projects, because now you can't really make a profit off of them, uh, often are abandoned. So sometimes you, we were working at cross purposes. You're giving food aid on one hand, and you're working with agricultural development. But if the food aid is depressing agricultural prices, it undercuts your efforts, direct efforts, uh, in terms of agricultural development. I think we're getting more sophisticated about this now, but there has been uh, a problem in the past. Um, the, uh, I think it's fairly clear, I think it's more than fairly clear, that economic incentives in terms of profits to farmers uh, are enormously powerful in virtually every country. And were farmers to be provided with these incentives, uh, particularly the poor farmers, the uh, production, agriculture production, and I think here I would, would emphasize Africa again, uh, could be very significantly increased. Now, uh, there is another problem. The Americans are less guilty of it, but the Europeans are, are quite guilty of it, um, is that most of the developed countries uh, tend to... Uh, export their price instabilities. Um, they maintain price stability at home in terms of food prices, and they export their instabilities abroad, which leads to hot, rapidly fluctuating food prices uh, in the less developed countries. And of course, what happens is in bad years, farmers are driven out, and they, of course, they can't get back in good years. Um, now, 
There's been a failure to adopt appropriate technology. It's another problem. Um, the, uh, part of it has to do with the technology that's available. Most of the technology that's available, of course, has been developed in the more advanced countries, and it, of course, usually implies uh, capital-intensive technology, tractors, this sort of thing. Um, banks and aid organizations have often encouraged this capital-intensive technology. It comes from the Western